Hey there, guys. This is Football Untangled, episode 18 of, of the Football Truth Podcast. I'm uh, happy and privileged to have Kira Lee, or Kira Leia. Is that right? Kira Lee. Kira Lee, yeah. Kira Lee. On <laughs> to episode 18. We're going to be talking all about quantum health and how it relates to performance on the pitch, athletics, and why athletes really need to take care of their off-pitch recovery to have the best on-field performance. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, likewise. Just to get things, just to get things started off, tell, tell all the athletes why it's so crazy and, and almost bombastic that a lot mm -hmm. of these pro clubs are having their athletes wear, uh, wear, Bluetooth monitors on their chest, like on those like kind of like sports bras and then also in their in their headsets. Yeah, I mean, that just opens up a whole can of worms in terms of where we can take things. But basically, we know that these devices, uh, they produce non native electromagnetic fields. And so these are devices that are carrying and emitting a field that is non native to our normal environment. So a little bit of a backstory is over hundreds of thousands of years, we kind of adapted and we've grown with our natural environment around us. And so that's kind of shaped who we are and what we've evolved to be. And we've become to live really in no separation with our environment. And so when we were forming, we were used to these electromagnetic fields that were native. And now, you know, with these devices, the radiation that's coming from my phone, from smart fridges, all these things, they're really non-native electromagnetic fields that are impairing our health mm -hmm. and contributing to the rise in chronic disease today which is a, is a big, big problem. And with the technology boom that's happening at the moment, we're starting to see more and more injuries, specifically in your area, sporting injuries, you know, becoming more and more common. And when you understand these things, uh, it's, it's really no surprise. And <laughs> I know you talk about this a ton, but yeah. yeah, I think that wearing these devices on yourself, especially when you're exerting, I guess, energy on the field is just... Nope, you know, it's, it's not a good idea because what this electromagnetic field is doing is it's really impacting your physiology and specifically your mitochondria. Mm -hmm. So we know that mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. And, you know, in, in high school, in, in biology, in university, I was taught that mitochondria are important because they produce ATP um, and that they also produce byproducts in the form of heat, CO2, water and light. Turns out the heat, water and light are actually not byproducts and the most important parts and we actually can use these byproducts to give our body energy and run various physiological processes. So we really don't want to be impairing these byproducts or the production of ATP as well in our mitochondria. And essentially what these fields are doing is they're really ruining your mitochondrial health. They're ruining cellular dehydration and they're limiting the outputs of your mitochondria, which is going to diminish the energy capacity of your body. Well said. I guess that's just some of the reasons, think, and I'll let you ask another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. With what area I think, you Yeah, yeah, I think what happens is a lot of times, a lot of these athletes, okay, how does this actually affect my performance? And that was the question I asked all those years ago, like when I first started looking into all this. And the reality is basically what, what you just said, just tell the guys how does it actually result in, in an effect in their muscles, in their fascia, in their bones, and also in their in their nervous system, and of course in their in their mental mm -hmm. health. Because although a lot of athletes don't want to don't want to admit it nowadays, like mental health is becoming more uh, more and more of an issue across the board. Yeah, of course. So I think that something uh, athletes would be quite, I guess, focused on and aware of is the importance of fascia in the body. And we're kind of told that fascia is important because it acts as, I guess, structure and it kind of keeps everything nice and tied and together and all our muscles in the right place. But fascia really is beyond that now. We know that fascia is this quantum superhighway of communication that's happening in our body all day long, all night. It's just, you know, uh, it's, it's quicker. It's an instantaneous form of communication throughout the body uh, than the biochemical processes, which we originally thought were the, the communication happenings in the body. But so... If you think of communication in the body, in order to have a healthy body, we really want this fascia to be healthy so that it can communicate to all the different parts of the body in instantaneous time. As I meant to, you know, you kick a ball that sends a signal up your body and impairs and it affects different areas of your physiology as well. So we really need to make sure it's imperative that our fascia health is you know, 
taken well care of. And so it's like, well, how can I take care of my fascia on a quantum lens? And that really stems down to environmental cues because our fascia is constantly sensing the environment around us and that can really impact its function. So in the notion of what we were talking about previously in terms of the fact we're genetically wired to suit the environment in which we originated in, which was the environment before all these artificial lights and non-native EMFs came into play, when we're you know, putting non-native EMFs and we're putting blue light into our environment, we're impairing our mitochondrial function. We're putting in essentially the wrong input signals into our body. Now, I think we can talk about this in terms of water because we know that hydration is such an important thing for us to be aware of. And I know athletes are always being told, you know, drink more water. But what actually happens if the water is not being made uh, abundant in the cell? You know, just because we drink water doesn't mean it can actually get into our cell. And, and what actually yeah. is water? Because I feel like, yeah, there's the common notion that the water in our body is just like the water that comes out of a tap or from a glass. And this can be true, but at certain times and most of the time, it actually is not true because this water, this metabolic water actually can become structured when it's imprinted by light. So we know that in cytochrome 4 in the electron transport chain, that's where water is made. And that's really important because we're going to talk about that cytochrome soon um, with non-native EMFs. But we create water, this metabolic water then can utilize the light from our environment. Now, red light does this most, and this is why athletes always use it in recovery phases as well or after an acute injury. But also all light does this. The light that our mitochondria emit as a byproduct also can structure our metabolic water. And so when this becomes structured, and we know this, I'll give credit to Dr. Gerald Pollack and his lab in Washington for finding the fourth phase of water. So when this water becomes structured, it essentially is changing its shape and it's becoming more dense. And so what it does is it charge separates this water. So we know that water is, I mean, we have protons and electrons in there. All the electrons kind of get secreted and they're pushed up against hydrophilic surfaces. So along that electron transport chain, you know, it keeps everything nice and tight in the right places, does lots of other things. And then we have the protons, which are positively charged. They're pushed out into more of this bulk water area and so what do we have? We have these opposing charges lined up against each other. And then what essentially is that? Well, that's a water battery. That is a battery. And uh, I love the experiment that Gerald, Gerald Pollack and his team did when they got tiny, tiny little electrodes that were actually invented by Gilbert Ling. And they popped them into each side of this exclusion zone water. And it was actually enough to power an LED light. So we do know that this actually can give our body energy. And the theory is, is that water is able to then put a whole host of energy at disposition to our cells. And so in terms of hydration and fascial health, we know that fascia needs to be hydrated and all our cells need to be hydrated. If you don't have one exclusion zone water, your fascial health is not going to be on point. And if you're an athlete, you want that fascia network. You want that important, that instantaneous communication throughout your body. It's so imperative. Um, so yeah, you want your fascia to be healthy, and then you also need to have this water in the first place. So back to our original question, when we were talking about non-native electromagnetic fields, especially around the heart, we know that most of our mitochondria reside in our heart. It's very dense in our brain as well. So what they're essentially doing is popping these devices in the places where they definitely should not be going. <laughs> and so one of the effects, and it's getting a little bit complicated and we can um, generalize it a little bit more if you'd like, but down to the nitty gritty, the low level, what it's essentially doing is so inside of our cells, we have these voltage gated calcium channels and they kind of open and close and they let calcium into the cell and change the redox and things like this. But let calcium into the cell and that's a signaling molecule like it's OK for calcium to be in the cell. It comes in, it kind of tells us, you know, this is what you need to do here and then sets off this cascade down here. And it's really important. But what happens when this voltage gated calcium channel becomes open chronically due to non-native electromagnetic fields that what it, that's what it does it forces these gates open it's we're letting in way too much calcium into the cell and you know calcium has a, a very different charge to what our cells supposed to normally be which is impacting its function but one of the main things that it's doing is it's causing nitric oxide to present inside the cell so this nitric oxide then binds to complex four in the electron transport chain where water is supposed to be made so not only is it dehydrating us, it's also doing it through the presentation of nitric oxide. And sorry, I didn't actually touch on this. I kind of went over it, but the non-native EMFs, they actually collapse the exclusion zone water. So Gerald Pollack and his team, 
it's actually a really funny story. It was a um, undergraduate student. He put the um, Wi-Fi router just next to the exclusion zone to see what it would do. And it actually completely collapsed and diminished the exclusion zone. So not only is it reducing the exclusion zone water, it's reducing this body battery of ours. It's also completely stopping metabolic water being made in the first place via the increase of calcium inside the cell. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so long story short, I, I get a lot of heat when I, when I talk about why it's bad that professional athletes are up late playing video games because the sad thing is a lot of these like, pro athletes that they're actually invested into like esports teams and so they're on like mm -hmm. twitch and they're streaming all day and then i get heat when i say well them doing that is going to lead to a higher likelihood of, of 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 not only injury but i'm also i also get a lot of uh heat for this but contact injury and mm -hmm. my kind of theory in that as well if you are basically ruining your fascia. If you are dehydrating the mitochondria, your brain and your nervous system is, is, is not going to be able to react as fast as it could when you have someone, for example, a tackling you. Now, is yeah. that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, when we become fascially impaired, I like to say, I like to call it. Yeah, exactly. So we have these these areas of dehydrated fascia, it's kind of like a net. If you have a net that's already got a hole in it or it's really dried out and you stretch that net, it's the area that's most dehydrated that is going to become effective first. And so we really want our fascia to be hydrated, you know, 100%, we're working in its maximum capacity, but we really don't want the fascia to be hydrated around the areas where we really don't want an injury, which is like our brain and our heart and our, and our joints and things like this. And unfortunately, you know, you're talking about these athletes publicizing themselves, being on Twitch and things like that, growing their audience, which is great, but it's really impacting their performance on the field because, as you said, they're not able to react as quickly to stimuluses, which is, again, just a negative feedback loop because then they're going to be more susceptible to these, these I guess, collisions on the field, which is then, you know, throwing blue light, lack of autophagy, apoptosis, and we can talk about that. But that stimulus in itself, like that knock, is going to ruin mitochondrial health in the first place. So if you're up all night, you know, on, we haven't gone into this yet, but you're on these non native EMF producing devices, you're not sleeping at all, which means it doesn't matter if you can actually undergo repair processes or not. If you're not sleeping, you're not going to be able to repair your cells. Your mitochondria really aren't getting the love that they need and the right input signals. So day in, day out, as you suffer these knocks on the field, you're not able to repair them properly. So it's kind of like you're just piling on these injuries on top of each other, which is going to just degrade fascial health and your performance as a whole. Yeah, it's it's that uh, domino effect where mm -hmm. like players get away with it for maybe a few weeks or a few months, and then all of a sudden there's mm -hmm. a a random injury or a uh, mm -hmm. misfortunate injury, which which I always think is the funniest thing that people think injuries are bad luck when. There are like a variety of causes that we can look at, but one of the most obvious ones that you've been covering so far is the fascia and the mitochondrial function. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that another big thing for athletes as well is definitely the blue light story because, you know, we spoke about the non-native EMFs effect on calcium and in the body. And, and I just wanted to say as well, it's not only, uh, I guess, the nitric oxide that's going to stop the the metabolic water from being created, when that calcium is actually in the cell, that mitochondria has to give up its position of making energy for your body and tunneling electrons, and it will start to sequester calcium and kind of clean up calcium in the first place. So then your cell just becomes completely dysfunctional. Um, but yeah, so I think I think uh, the blue light as well does this very similar thing. But in terms of the most damaging effect that it has on our body, especially for athletes, I think it's definitely the lack of autophagy while we're sleeping. Because, and do you want me to go into this a little bit, the blue light and melatonin and cortisol? Yeah, please. Yeah? Uh, uh, just uh, like like one story before you go into that. I There was a time, like I think about like, a, there was a time about like two years ago that I, that I was working with like a major player uh, in Mexico and like he played for like, for a big national team in South America. And, you know, obviously these guys invest a lot in their bodies and their health and whatever. And it's like, 
I found out he's on Twitch until like 2 a.m. every night. <laughs> so, and that's just a, that's just an, uh, an example of even these guys at the highest level don't truly realize what these things are doing to them. But and that's so empowering in itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's you would have been like, no, <laughs> not another Twitcher. <laughs> yeah, really. Your worst nightmare. But I think that's so empowering as well because you're like, if I'm this good at what I do, if I'm this good as an athlete, imagine how far I can go if I simply start mitigating and making these small changes in my environment. Imagine mm-hmm. how much better I can be because you're saying that even these top players aren't aware of how the body truly works or maximizing their performance via quantum health implementation. So, you know, we have people who are aware of this have such an opportunity now to just go leaps and bounds in their performance when they actually take into consideration the effects of an unnatural environment on their health. Yeah, I think that's that's so important. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, yeah, so um, I I kind of want to give a little bit of backstory in case people don't really understand. But before we talk about cortisol, so... um, Our our body, let's just for the sake of this podcast, let's just all agree here that our body gets information from the light in its environment. And this light communicates information to our body of how best to run its physiology. So what I mean by that is light all day long, we just see illumination coming from the sun. Sometimes it's darker than others and that's, that's about it. But light is truly made up of all these different frequencies and all these different blends that are constantly changing and chopping all throughout the day but we just don't see that. So we don't see streams of like red, blue, UV coming from the sun. We just see illumination. But Mm -hmm. in the morning, it truly is these blend of light frequencies that stimulates to our body. Okay, it's time to make our hormones. It's time to build this exclusion zone water. You know, we know that red light's really prominent in the morning. So it's going to really expand our exclusion zone water. We know that UV later in the day increases the negative charge of this water. So it's charging the battery all these types of things. So something else that light does is the blue light that's in our environment that comes from the sun, that's always balanced by red and the other light frequencies, it uh, it, it kind of raises our cortisol, right? Mm-hmm. So we have cortisol, it keeps us awake. You know, if cortisol is too high because we're stressed, you know, we start to feel sick in the morning, that's a common indicator. So we have this rise in cortisol during the day. Now, just to simplify things, you can kind of think as, uh, I guess, cortisol and melatonin as like arch enemies. And they don't want to be in the same room. They're like competing competitors on the field. They, mm-hmm. they don't want to know each other. And so every time that cortisol is present, we kind of have this natural suppression in melatonin. And that's the way they're meant to cycle. And that's what truly is keeping circadian rhythm. Well, one of the ways that we keep circadian rhythm. And so at nighttime, when the sun's setting, the frequencies that t- that's taken out of our environment is this blue light. So at sunset, there is no blue light in our environment. Our body then, if we're exposing ourselves to the sunset, which we're not these days, that's another issue. (laughs) So our body senses this lack of blue light. It says, okay, it's, you know, getting getting night now, it's getting dark. I need to start secreting that melatonin. Um, We can talk about how melatonin is made. I think that'll be fun. But we start secreting this melatonin into our system so that Kira can get sleepy. Now, melatonin is not only important because it makes us sleepy, it also governs cell repair processes and kind of uh, we need a certain level of melatonin in our body to go through and repair those damaged cells we might have through the day from injuries on the field or simply just falling over from day-to-day tasks. You know, our cells are constantly recycling. So we constantly need to go through these cell repair cycles when we're sleeping, which to clean ourselves up every day, reduce the risk of injury. It's really great for healing. And then also to reduce the risk of chronic disease like tumors and things like this as well. We're talking about sports, so let's talk about muscle regeneration and things like this. Um, So what has Modern Living done? It's introduced blue light at nighttime. You know, you're saying that your players are on Twitch all night staring at a blue light screen, constantly stimulated, which is also going to raise their cortisol. Mm -hmm. And then we see this decrease in melatonin. Now, if we have a decrease in melatonin, we're less likely to go through the cell cleanup repair cycles that we need to go through every single night in order to have good fascial health, to have healthy mitochondria, to really tap into uh, all the energy in our body, all the energy sources. So if you're up all night, you're staring at blue light screens, you're on Twitch, uh, you know, you're chronic- chronically stressed or you're training late at night, this is all going to impact your body's ability to undergo cell repair processes. Now, sleep in itself is also important because if we're not asleep, let's say where I live, it's about 9 p.m. at night. I'm also not going to get the human growth hormone secreted into my body at around 10 p.m. It just won't happen. So let's say I don't go to bed till midnight. 
that's just not going to happen. And we know that human growth hormone is really important for growth and repair. So that's another reason that I guess isn't talked about as much in the quantum world, but I think it's very important. <laughs> on, the, on the note of, uh, of human growth hormone, there's a funny story about people always, people who are like anti-Messi fans, they'll say, oh, Messi just got, <laughs> what was that? Anti-Messi? I don't know who that is. Oh, no, oh so like, uh, I like one of the books. Uh, one of the best players in the world, his name's Messi. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. so there's 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 guys who are like anti-Messi um, haters, whatever. And they'll mm. always joke about how like when he was 13, he got like human growth, uh, human growth hormone injections because he had some kind of like rare disease. And then I always say, well, if that's a solution, then you can go get the injections and then let me know when you're playing for for FC Barcelona. But at the same token, based on what you just talked about, there are some things that are free and natural that you can actually do on your own to increase your home, your own uh, intrinsic human growth hormone production. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. By going to bed at, on time, going to bed <laughs> early, blocking the blue light, watching the sunrise as well, because melatonin is something I love to talk about is actually stored sunlight energy. And what I mean by that is uh, we have these benzene rings, especially tryptophan in the back of our eyes. And so these benzene rings, they're literally ring shaped. And so you can think of this like a ball going through a hoop, you're playing basketball and the hoop is this benzene ring and the ball is photons of light. So in the morning, when you get the right light signals, that really is like shooting a ball through a hoop. So you're shooting that morning light into that benzene ring. That tryptophan, that aromatic amino acid can then capture this light. And then the pathway that it kind of goes down is to serotonin and then back to melatonin and then it's recycled day in, day out. So it's not only important to just catch the sunrise on, on days that you're playing or you know in on season, it's also in off season as well, because these you kind of think of them stacking sunrises, increasing this, I guess, recycling mechanism between melatonin, mm -hmm. tryptophan, serotonin. So that's going to increase your level of melatonin as well. So there's two sides to the picture is you need to get that morning sunlight to make melatonin to be released in darkness in the absence of blue light at nighttime. So you need to be getting both of those things, uh, which is going to increase your sleep quality, work hand in hand with human growth hormone, which if you're in bed on time, it's going to get secreted into your system every night. Um, I was actually reading an article the other day that during winter, you actually secrete more human growth hormone, which is quite interesting mm -hmm. um, in yeah, terms of of yeah so you know winter time it's always been sold to us as like this time of replenishment and regeneration but now we look at the hormones and what they're doing it like truly is important during winter especially yeah the funny thing on that topic i probably the most asked question i, I always get is how do i work with nature in the winter it's cold and there's no sun well like mm -hmm. first of all mate you need to be embracing nature <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have to embrace nature because the winter is not man-made the, the winter's there for is is there for a reason and just ex explain to the to to the athletes how how the light spectrum actually works cuz i think you i think it was you or someone else had a post recently about only only about 1% of the light spectrum is is actually visible and so on days where it's cloudy there's there is light that comes through that's not visible yeah, that's exactly right. So this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because you can take it into more of a spiritual aspect. But if we're looking at the electromagnetic radiation of the environment, visible light really truly only makes up 1% of that. And that's the light that we're able to see. That's that visible light. But then we also have this infrared light and we also have this UV light that we can't kind of see. Mm -hmm. And we know that light can act as both a particle and a wave. And what determines where it goes is our consciousness actually imprinting on that, which can change the outcome of, of that light and turn it into a particle. So, you know, the notion is, and it's something I love to go into, is that we don't see the red light, we don't see infrared, and we don't see UV because we're not supposed to change the outcomes of those light, mm -hmm. which is so interesting. But so we might be able to see light in our environment, but it still is coming in. So embracing the seasonal changes, even though it's not very sunny outside or whatnot, is still important. And that is still communicating information to our body. So if we know that sunlight is important and getting out in summer and maximizing your vitamin D is important, then we also know if you're living by nature's principles, even though science really hasn't caught up yet, well, it, it kind of is, you know, well, actually, okay, I rephrase that. It's kind of always been there, but it's been suppressed. And now some modern day researchers are kind of investing money into this again. 
But so it's really important if you're living by this rule to embrace nature as well. So um, something that we can get into is, is mitochondrial health, which we've been speaking on a ton. Uh, something called mitochondrial heteroplasmy. And basically the way I like to explain this to people without going in too deep is that um, we have respiratory proteins in our mitochondria and they tunnel electrons. So they move electrons through the body and then that makes water and ATP and all these things really important. Um, so electrons, they only like to jump so far. So as you, know, you can think of it, me, I can only jump one meter. So I can jump from you know, this stool to the next as long as it's one meter away. But what happens if the space increases between the two stools is I can't make it to the other side. So I'm going to fall. I'm not going to make it to where I need to be. This is the same as our electrons. So they can only tunnel six to 10 angstroms. Now, if they do not, if the space between these two respiratory proteins is too far, if it's more than 10 angstroms, we really start to see a loss in energy. And then these can become toxic to the cell. They can take, uh, they can start pulling apart like the lipid bilayer anywhere basically because electrons like to be in pairs. So we're constantly trying to grab electrons from anywhere that it can inside the cell and basically act as inflammation. So we really want to keep the space between these respiratory proteins nice and tight and at the right level. Now in summer, they're going to naturally increase, not to a detrimental level, perhaps maybe if you're living in a, in a toxic environment. And they also increase as we age. So one of the main importances of getting cold, especially in winter, and if you're just starting your health journey, you probably have an increase in these respiratory proteins. So to speed up this tunneling, to have really nice energy flow, you need to be getting cold to start to reduce this heteroplasmy and this space between your respiratory proteins. So in winter, when we're getting cold, what we're essentially doing is we're pulling these respiratory proteins closer together. And that truly is the aim of the game. That is what's going to stop you from aging. That's what's going to increase uh, undo the damage done by non-native EMFs. It's going to really speed up energy efficiency in the body. Um, another thing is exclusion zone water does this. So when we get cold, something that our body does is our mitochondria kind of rearranges and it produces more heat and more light. So then this light can structure exclusion zone water. Now, if we think of winter time as well, where, where we should be eating seasonally. So if you're somewhere where the UV is low or you have no UV because it's, it's winter, there's no carbohydrates growing in your environment either. Mm -hmm. So this means that it's a time for ketosis. It's a time for maybe intermittent fasting. It's time for eating fats and protein from hunted game because the animals slow down. Ancestrally, we could hunt them more. So this diet of high fat is actually going to produce more mitochondrial water as well from that complex four because fat produces more water when we break it down than carbohydrates. So we look at we have more water, we have more heat, we have more exclusion zone water. We have more of this free energy to put energy out to the disposition of the cells. So, yeah, um, being being seasonally compliant, getting cold, allowing your body to sense those environmental cues of cold, making this exclusion zone water, which is going to pull the electron transport chain closer together, decrease your heteroplasmy, increase energy efficiency, reduce the span in which I have to run. Like if you're an athlete, and let's say that you have to run for 500 meters, you're going to disperse a lot of energy. But what happens if we reduce that space to 200 meters, which is essentially what we're doing in our mitochondria when we get cold, is you're going to need less energy to run across. And that's the same thing that's happening. So the winter time really makes us more energy efficient and, and increases the health of our mitochondria, which is super important. But if you're not getting cold and you're not embracing the season, we don't have this reverse in heteroplasmy and year after year, it's just going to continually increase. Then you chuck on blue light and in an inability to get rid of those damaged mitochondria and then an inability to repair while you're sleeping it's just a recipe for disaster and you know most athletes are living their lives like this and it's no surprise that chronic illness and any sports injuries is on the rise yeah i think i think so I basically just <laughs> what was that sorry i know that was a lot of information i'm sorry yeah, yeah, no, that was fabulous. I mean, the the great thing about podcasts like this is all of you guys sh uh, should go back and watch it a few times, and take notes, and understand that basically, you know, nature hides a lot of complexity underneath the skin, and you know, in inside of inside of simplicity is the way I kind of phrase it, and 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 you're basically kind of uh, going kind of. Uh, you are 
putting some light on the on the deeper layers of understanding that helps guys realize okay now i now i get why i need to do this because for years i've been telling guys you know uh sunrise be grounded you know everything that we just covered but they don't uh, but they won't do it until they hear the like the the science so to speak Mm -hmm. well that's exactly right and i think i feel like people they love to buy things as well like what do you mean um you know i can't get health from this helmet or i can't get health from this supplement (laughs) or this is what's increasing my health and i'm like yeah it's connecting with nature but then the thing is and you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't learn the mechanisms because when you truly understand like i'm sure you do a lot of education with your clients when you truly understand the complexity behind the simplicity you're like okay now i know what i need to do it what i need to do to be healthy Mm -hmm. i understand why and then you're more inclined to actually do the measurable actions because they're not fun you know i'm sure people have lots of fun on twitch every night but they're not going to be having fun when they've torn the acl at the start of their season so it's just something to consider yeah yeah i mean that's kind of one of the things that I always talk about is when you get injured and, you know, God forbid you're in the hospital, you're going to be there alone. The the physio mm-hmm. and the trainers and your buddies online are not, not going to be there with you. Uh, it's, it's like your need that's being opened up. And I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced that firsthand. So it's, it's no joke. And like nowadays we're seeing like ACL tears almost every week at the highest, highest, highest level at, clubs that have the best facilities in the world and supposedly have the best doctors and the best uh, yes. uh, methods so to speak mm-hmm. uh, and how do you how do you see sorry how do you see um with your clients the reduction in injuries and things like that through doing the quantum stuff i'm just interested talking to someone like yourself who actually works with these people every single day yeah basically i mean across the board we see people feeling more effortless on the pitch feeling Mm -hmm. free it's and also there's basic improvements like their their uh skin improves other sleep improves all their all their like energy levels improve how fast they recover how many games Mm -hmm. they can play uh from a quantum perspective and the big thing is guys and like obviously if i work with players that that are already that are already at a high level, they already do have a pretty good mitochondrial function, but of course they are doing some things that are less than ideal. And so when you kind of fix that in their lifestyle, you, you do see some pretty big improvements because they already have kind of the, the base. And on that topic, I wanted to, to, one of the things I've always looked at that's interesting is the work. And I think you've already interviewed him and you probably already know a bunch about him, but Dr. Jack Cruz, and talking mm-hmm. about how basically how muscle fibers can be influenced by the amount of UV light that you are uh, exposed to in uh, in your childhood. And so that that speaks to why there there are so many good athletes coming out and and more so specifically why there's so many good football players that come from regions that are closer to the equator. Can you can you mm-hmm. can you explain why? that is yeah i mean not to mention their fascial health is completely amazing i mean all these players um, and i'm going to say dark skin not because i'm trying to put anyone in a box but it's because you know if you have dark skin it's because you grew up or you're from somewhere that has high uv their fascial health is amazing like have you seen these people jump it is like incredible and Mm. i think that's a direct relation between fascial health but yeah so if you're so I think what he's kind of alluding to, and I mean, he can probably be talking about in a different way. Jack Cruz is very, I guess, mystical in the way he speaks. It's like you get three, I started studying him in 2020 and you get three sentences into one of his blog posts and you're like, am I actually dumb? Like, (laughs) I don't (laughs) understand any of it. Um, But slowly, slowly, you know, the first sentence you've already Googled 15 words and pulled up 20 documents of study, but you get there in the end if you're persistent. But um, so there's this thing called haplotypes um, and depending on where you originate from is the type of uh, mitochondrial haplotype that you have. And so these mitochondria can be extremely uncoupled or they can be more coupled. And so we inherit our mitochondria from our mother, actually in really rare circumstances, I think at 0.1%, we actually inherit them from dad. And I actually don't know 
um, if that's a correlation between mitochondrial health or not. So the suspicion I have is that if mother's mitochondrial health is really, really poor, then perhaps it takes and subsides on the dad's mitochondria. I'm not really sure, but that's my suspicion. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're really, if we think of our mitochondrial haplotype, which is directly correlated with the place in which our female lineage designed um, and I guess evolved. So um, I got my haplotype tested and it's like an LN6, which tells me that my mitochondrial lineage is from Western Europe. So that means my mitochondria are more suited and adapted to get cold. Now, if you're somewhere uh, from somewhere that's hot all the time, your mitochondria are more adapted for heat. So depending on how your mitochondria runs determines your athleticism as well. And that's why we see all these men with dark skin who, and women who are from regions that are high in UV, they have really good athletic abilities. They can run really quickly and they can jump because that's directly correlated with their type of mitochondria. Um, we can also talk about this in the sense that we really need to be ensuring as females that our mitochondria are really, really healthy because that's what we're going to pass on to the next generation as well. So if you, I've seen a big correlation actually between uh, women who had kids quite late um, and athletic abilities of their children and just the health of their children in general, because we see this increase in mitochondrial heteroplasmy. So the later in life that you have children, I guess the worse off your mitochondria are going to be when you have children like when the mitochondria are going to be that you pass down to your children but in saying that if you're someone who's optimizing your circadian health you really are miles ahead of most people so you could be 60 years old and have healthier mitochondria than people who are on twitch all night at 20 years old so that's it's good to know that you can easily reverse it but yeah when jack's talking about fascial health and, and the uv i definitely think that plays a role um how exactly the pathway is happening and how that's moving forward I, i'm not too sure sorry <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, there's a few studies that I, I found talking about the influence of vitamin D on on specific on specific type of muscle fiber composition that mm -hmm. the ones with higher vitamin D were the ones that were higher fast twitch. And obviously those guys are the ones that are better athletes. But on that kind of yeah, same read, topic. Yeah, go ahead. I've read some studies like that and I'm someone who's such a nerd. So I'm like, I really need to understand this entire pathway before I talk about it. Um, <laughs> but it, it makes sense. It makes sense, right? When we look at, and you don't need a biochemistry lab to look at these things. It's like, we can see high UV, more vitamin D, increased athleticism, better fascial health. You can kind of see the correlation without having to do the deep science. Mm -hmm. Well, like for me, at least it's always, okay, I see the science. And I, and I understand this and, and the theories and the assumptions. And then I look, okay, what's actually happening in nature? And then at the same time, what's actually happening at the highest level of competition in sports? Because that's where you see the cream rise, the cream rise to, the, to the top. And mm -hmm. all the science gets, gets tossed out the window when you have to win uh, a match, you know? And one of, the, one of the interesting things I wanted to, to talk about is in England, there are a lot of, of dark-skinned people that were brought there uh, many years ago, and, 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 and a lot of them are some of the best athletes that come from the UK. And so because of their haplotype and where they are on the planet, they have basically a huge circadian mismatch in terms mm -hmm. of the winters in England versus in Ghana or Nigeria or somewhere where it's warm and there's lots of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. The question being is what can guys like that try to do to help their situation? Obviously if, if they can't move back to the area that they were from yeah. originally. It's funny that you brought this up because I actually have a new client who's in this exact same position. So his family mm -hmm. are from India, but they originated in Africa and now he's living in the UK. And instantly he jumped on the Zoom call and I was like, oh, wow, I'm taking one look at you and I know that you should not be in the UK. So these people, they predominantly suffer with things like fatigue, vertigo. And I think that's a huge haplotype mismatch, right? Because their haplotype's not designed to be there. I think that people do better switching from, like, let's say a cold environment to a warm environment than people who go from high UV to low UV. I think those are the people that are really going to struggle long term until the haplotype starts to adjust, but that takes, you know, so long, many, many years. But yeah, so things that they can do to help their situation would be, I guess, getting out in the sun as much as possible. So, you know, we always talk about this, but you really need to be maximizing on the sun. 
as much as you can. I know that following nature's life cycles is most important because the light cycles around you really determines your metabolism as well. And this is why I'm not a big fan of UV light, uh, I guess artificial UV light in the form of a spray lamp or things like that in winter. But maybe for you, if you're someone who's just getting into quantum health, having that additional UV light you know, in the summer even is going to be of benefit to you because even though the UV might be somewhat high, it's just not as high as what your body's originated to adapt to. So I think the introduction of something like a spurty lamp during the summer can be helpful in certain situations, depending on the person's symptoms and also just for optimizing health. I think that in the winter, now I've done a lot of study and work on this because there's lots of practitioners who opt for in this exact circumstance. They opt for these people, the mismatch haplotype to to utilize a spurty lamp in the winter. But I just don't think mm. that is optimal. Um, and every practitioner is individual. I think that winter time is a time for increased a decreased heteroplasmic. It's a time for getting cold, regardless of what your haplotype is, if you're in that location. So, you know, we're all around non-native EMS all the time. It's a massive, massive issue. We've all sped up time internally. We're all aging quicker. Mitochondrial health in the bin. So I think that really getting cold, regardless of your haplotype in winter is super important. I don't recommend that anyone who's getting into quantum health uh, should be implementing UV light in the winter, unless it's in your in your location. Um, I just wanted to say that because lots of people, they get into the quantum health space and they start following people online that are quantum health experts. And then they're getting sold all these devices and all these biohacking tools. But mm. I guess my notion is that you can't biohack 3.8 billion years of evolution. And so above all, it's important to, to adjust to the seasonal cycles, regardless of your haplotype, intensifying UV in the summer through a spurty great getting a red light well in some instances depending if, if you're sick if you have certain diseases perhaps it's probably not a good idea you might want to do red light first red light's great because that's really going to increase the water so it actually upregulates cytochrome complex four so you're going to make more intracellular water more exclusion zone water it's also going to structure that water and give you more energy but yeah and you really have to care for your melanin status in your body so you know melanin in our skin it absorbs light and it can charge, separate water and give us free energy, kind of like water, but a bit different. Um, and it also reflects light. So if you have high melanin in your skin and you're dark and then you're in a place like the UK, chances are you're actually reflecting some light that you actually should be absorbing. So the darker you are, the less light that's actually going to make it into your body, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you're somewhere that there's low UV, you want to be having light skin so that you can absorb more light. That's the aim of the game. So that's essentially where the mismatch comes from now. You also need to be working on your intracellular melanin, meaning that it's kind of made from dopamine is one of the ways. So this is going to sound a bit hippy-dippy, but even just feeling grateful because we know that gratitude and feelings of happiness, they actually can create more dopamine in your body and then intracellular melanin can be chopped out of that. So making sure you're feeling positive and happy and not all doom and gloom can also help keep your body uh, high redox and, and give you intracellular energy as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I always tell my guys... Uh... And this quote is from uh, Dr. 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 Tommy John. A a a happy donut is always better than is always better than a sad salad. And basically, like it speaks to this idea that there should be some some emotional intensity to what you're eating, but then also that travels over to how do you live. And if you if you surround yourself with people that are negative and toxic and depressive, you'll likely be that too. You know. <laughs> That's exactly right. Like it's, it's, it's information. Like these frequencies are information and I'm so, I guess, right-minded and I'm like, show me, you know, I spent six years at university. So I'm like, show me the peer reviewed journal articles, show me the data, but the more and more I learn, it's like, okay, I'm starting to see a trend in the data here and, and nature's always right. But something, you know, I get asked a lot is like, okay, so I need exclusion zone water for my fascial health. Do I need to drink exclusion zone water? Like, do I need to drink structured water? Like what device do I get? And is that going to increase the exclusions and water in my body? And it's like, well, no, through the pH changes, it doesn't directly mean that it's going to, you know, stay structured and then it's going to make it into your cell and mm. be made as metabolic water structure. That's virtually impossible. But what it's actually doing is it's increasing the coherence of your water, which is essentially signaling like information to you. Like they did that study on plants when they spoke horrible words to the water that they, they fed the plant with. 
And then they spoke really beautiful words like love and gratitude, and then they fed the plants with that water. Now, no surprise, the plants who were fed love and gratitude grew quicker and they spurted more, more flowers, right? So mm. that you're actually imprinting that energetic vibration into that water as information. And then you're drinking that water or that food or whatever, you know, mum's cooking always tastes good because she actually makes it with love and imprints that energy into it. Mm. So we're actually drinking that water, we're consuming that frequency and that's going to impact our physiology in, in ways that we just can't even comprehend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that also, um, it goes to show how important it is when you're growing up and your parents, how they talk to you. And if mm -hmm. your parents have a fixed mindset about sports, about school, even about money, you know, some, some people are kind of, uh, th this, this, this negative mindset about money is thrust upon them from their parents ha having, mm -hmm. uh, having some, having something, what having what some might call a broke mentality, <laughs> but that it just goes to show when you fill yourself up with not only, you know, good light and good food, but also good people, good words into your mind, it, it makes exactly. a big difference. And yeah, I one of the things agree. I wanted to there you go. go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I definitely agree with you and the whole money scenario and just parental mm -hmm. vibrations and outlooks impacting the way that we think. And then our like mindset later in life as well, perhaps it might not even come up until we're parents that those things start mm -hmm. to show up in different ways. Yeah, exactly. And one of the topics that you just mentioned earlier, really quickly is about when someone gets into quantum health and then they're pitched all these different devices and things that, mm -hmm. that was me like when I first started you know like the different red light devices and the different UV lamps and the different grounding things and now I don't even I, I really don't recommend any of those uh unless there's mm -hmm. like a uh, unless there's like a really specific uh need and I mean like like uh, for the most time like as a coach that has courses and and like programs one of the worst things is when you have someone sign up and obviously they pay for your program and then right, right when they sign up, you say, okay, now go buy all this stuff. <laughs> it's just not the yeah, way that yeah. I think life works and nature, you know, like it's, it's, it's a thousand times better to find a natural um, hot spring up in the mountains in the winter than to go buy some super overpriced device, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think that, at the end of the day, we're all held accountable by free will. Um, and it's the choices we make in life that determine our health. And so you have the decision to do whatever you want. So if you're someone who's, I know, one of the things that I deal with a lot is I get clients that live in a city and then they're like, oh crap, I, I need to move out of the city now because I understand why it's so bad for my health. And then they're like, oh, but I can't because I'm my job's here and I'm making so much money. And so if you're someone who wants to prioritize that money and you wanna stay in the city, then perhaps you might need to invest money into some devices like a red light or, or whatever it might be, grounding sheets or you know whatever, mm -hmm. to substitute your decision in terms of you know staying in that location or whatever it may be, whatever the problem may be that you're choosing to be in. And, and in doing that, you know that your health's not going to be optimal, but can it be far greater than without having those devices? 100%. But in terms of being optimal, it's far more beneficial to just get out on the ground. You, there's there's nothing that infuriates me more than seeing practitioners. The other a practitioner the other day, she had a, her windows closed, and I think it was like eight a.m. So it was you know past UVA rise, and she was wrapped up in an infrared blanket, which is producing exclusions on water. So she's saying you know, get your infrared to start the day and and uh, structure your water in your body. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that electromagnetic field that's being put on your body via those cords and that blanket is doing the exact opposite. So you really need to have the education. You know, when I got into this, I was like, oh, you know, I left uh, the centralized education system and became a decentralized health coach when I found this stuff out. Cause I was like, there's no way that I can be a nurse and care for people mm -hmm. through the centralized system. That's not doing anyone uh, a service. It's actually a disservice to me and, and the world. So you know, I was like, how can I make money off this? If I make a business out of this, how can I turn it into a profitable business? You know, I don't want a lot of money, but, you know, it'd be nice to just make a wage. And I was like, education. Education is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And taking the time to explain these concepts to people is what's most important. So that when they see someone who's trying to sell them a $400 red blanket that's going to increase their excretion zone water, 
they know, okay, maybe that's actually not right because they have the information needed to think for themselves and think critically. So I think that getting into quantum health isn't about buying supplements and trying to buy hack nature. It's really just investing in your education, understanding these things, so then you can take your health back into your own hands and become your own doctor. And so whether you're living in the UK or you need to move to Australia, you have the information you need to to achieve optimal health in whatever environment you're in and whatever age you're at. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing that infuriates me more than people preaching quantum and then making money off selling people these products. It's just so disheartening. And they're big people too, charging thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars for their information and, and selling products. I think it's just such a disservice, but... That's just a personal opinion of mine. Sorry. No, no, I'm. Uh, I've been. I've had my fair share of. Uh, <laughs> I guess like I'll say ar- arguments or, basically, just calling calling people out that have these huge businesses about selling some some kind of, uh, like she legit or some kind of, um, dried antioxidants. Yeah, dried like dried liver chips or something like that, and I'm just going, mm-hmm. well, you still wear sunglasses. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then that's like the owner of some sunglass some blue blocking companies i kind of went and looked at their like who actually owned them mm-hmm. and then they have photos of their whole family wearing sunglasses and their baby wearing sunglasses and i'm like <laughs> oh my god and you own a blue light blocking company like you should know better yeah i i've seen all i've seen things like that times 10 like people that want to have people that want to sell like diet programs and then and then they're overweight or, you know mm-hmm. i just um yeah. That's a that that that's a big message that I think you've 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 echoed here, but we haven't said the words. Is that nature is a big reality check, and if you don't you you know kind of live and operate within nature's laws, you'll 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 usually get found out eventually. Mm-hmm. I think that's exactly right. I mean, nature doesn't bend for anyone. You know, your mm-hmm. professor at university marking your test might be like, "Oh, Kira's had a really stressful year." You know, you know she's working in the city or her dad died or whatever, let's just give her some extra points. Like we'll take that into consideration. We'll give her an extension. Nature's not giving anyone an extension. It's like, this is it. This is the decentralized health. This is how it works. And your free will, which you have, will determine what choices you make and then breed the outcome of health that you have. So you can live within nature's laws and achieve optimal health and, or you can try and biohack nature and, and see where that takes you, but it's not going to be optimal. But then I know, I don't know. Everyone's in different situations. If you're someone that is like, I know Jack Cruz is very big on, uh, I guess you do or you don't. And he's very decentralized, like nature. It's like no extensions for anyone. Mm. Like everyone's optimal is different. If someone has a family that brings them so much joy and they love them very much and they perhaps they're from India and they now live in the UK with their family, perhaps moving back to the UK, moving back to India would be very lonely for them and very emotionally taxing. So even though the UK might not be best for their health, is it probably going to make them happier in the long run to stay there and then just utilize what they can? Probably. But that's the decision that that person's making. So I completely understand, especially when, you know, the system that we're kind of bought into is you go to school, you get good grades, you go to university, you get a big kid job, you get into debt, you get a house, you get a, get a car and then you get a wife and kids. And now you're responsible for bringing in money for the family and then you realize you hate your job. So then you buy more things to make yourself happy and now you're in more debt then you learn that you get bad health and you learn what real health is about and then you can't move because you're in so much debt that you can't leave your job like that's actually what I see that's the most common scenario that I see play out again and again with clients is that they literally can't leave because doing so would just diminish their quality of life so much that it would actually impact their health so it's kind of all about working where you are um, with what you've got but at the end of the day, I think that this area is great because a lot of young people are getting on board before they've gone down that route so they can really make smart decisions and how best to set themselves up so they can really utilize and access nature as much as they need to. Yeah, I think uh, a few years ago when the, um, there was a big thing that happened, <laughs> a lot of people kind of uh, <laughs> either woke up or they didn't wake up and you saw this great divide. Uh, from people that mm-hmm. really dove into their education and and thus from there they're able to make better decisions about their their work and their lifestyle and what kind of tribe they want to be part of and I think that's a big thing I think also online right now like we're seeing a bunch of uh, you know I don't really call myself an influencer but I ha- you know, have a page 
and then there's you know uh, people of like mind that are like selling similar things but then don't walk the walk and so it's like okay who's who's actually walking the walk that's the big question that i that that i'm always asking yeah that's really important i mean i think that's so important as well like and our ability to critically think and be human you know, I see all the time um, the ancestral movement is like really big, especially with young women at the moment on Instagram. And you see these people preaching like anti-technology and like, let's raise our kids in front of mountains, not screens. But then they've got their phone like in their kid's face constantly. Like, I'm like, no, get that radiation away from your child's head. Like all these things. Like, <laughs> And it's just, you know, people are using social media or becoming influencers, but they're not actually walking the walk. So it's important to recognize that as well, that, yeah, I'm not going to really go into that too much more, but that's my opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I was having sushi a few nights ago, and there was a family. They had two kids. They're like probably like toddlers, and they had two huge iPads just in front of them. Oh and then I look at the parents, and you know, I think the parents were still kids. You know. <laughs> yeah, Maybe they are. In- they are. Maybe they're in uh, adult bodies, but still kids nonetheless. But I don't want to take up. It's -hmm. just what it's doing to us. It's making us constantly rely on it, ruining our body's ability to make its own dopamine, ruining our circadian rhythm. And we're constantly relying on this quick form content, this instant gratification. And that's what's breeding into people. You know, you see all these people talking about wanting to live an ancestral life and I'm looking at them even people that I know, I'm like, if you actually went back to an ancestral life, you wouldn't be happy. You would not be happy because you are so used to this instant gratification. You're so used to these things. Like you want to live an ancestral life so that you can have your phone there and record yourself doing that and then get followers and likes on Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is. It's like just a weird time that we're in. But fortunately enough, there's people like you and um, other people in the space that are really speaking on these, in these topics and they're being real people, you know, real humans just showing up online spreading information and I think that's what we need to focus on and and feel gratitude inside of us to build our internal melanin (laughs) yes indeed I thank you so much what's uh just to wrap things up I don't want to take up too much more of your time but just to give guys basically a what what should guys be changing right now if they want to be their best Yeah. Well, this is a show for athletes, so let's focus on athleticism. I think they really need to be cutting their their exposure to non-native EMFs. So keeping your phone away from you at all times as much as possible, using loudspeaker, you know, not having these Bluetooth devices on them as much as possible. You know, if you're on Twitch, even, even just swapping from, like, let's say you're just starting your journey, even just swapping to a wired Um, handheld device when you're playing your games as opposed to a wireless Mm -hmm. is a step in the right direction just really becoming educated yeah and limiting that so that you can have this healthy fascia and you can have exclusion zone water and good mitochondrial health (laughs) fantastic where can uh people where can people find out more about you yeah so i'm pretty uh i guess uh, active on Instagram. So it's Kira Lee Wellness, K I E R A L E A Wellness. Um, that's where I am. I also have some YouTube videos up, which is like the same name with some different, I guess, influencers and researchers in the space, which is cool. It's fun. And yeah, I also offer uh, an educational platform. So it's like a monthly fee, and you can jump on and I talk about these subjects from time to time, and you can ask questions and things like that. But yeah that's all my services and what I do. I'd love to see people asking questions on my content and, and coming over and joining the tribe. Yeah, guys. Uh, I was, um, I was stoked to, to have this conversation and I'm really uh, looking forward to what kind of feedback we get from the community. And if anyone has any questions for, uh, for Kira, please follow her, give her a comment, DM her and uh, just fix yourself and you'll be happy for it. All right. This is episode 18 of the Football Truth Podcast. Thank you guys so much. Kira, thank you again. And we will see you guys very soon.